St. James's online worship as we celebrate the day of Pentecost. I hope that something in today's worship will connect you more deeply with the Holy Spirit whose coming we celebrate today. Our service continues with the opening acclamation. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ is risen indeed! Alleluia! Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day you opened the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of your Holy Spirit. Spread abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel, that it may reach to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
Les jours de la Pentecôte l'arrivée, ils ont tous été réunis ensemble, côté A. Ils ont été comme ça, et puis ils ont seul bris sorti dans le ciel là. Tant qu'ils ont un gros vent qui a soufflé, ils ont plein tout le cas là, côté ils ont chita ensemble. E verem que o que parecia línguas de fogo, que se separaram e pousaram sobre cada um deles. Todos ficaram cheios do Espírito Santo e começaram a falar em outras línguas conforme o Espírito os capacitava. Em Jerusalém, aber wohnten Juden, fromme Männer aus allen Völkern unter dem Himmel. Als sich das Getöse erhob, strömte die Menge zusammen und war ganz bestürzt, denn jeder hörte sie in seiner Sprache reden. Y estaban atónitos y maravillados diciendo, Mirad, no son Galileos todos estos que hablan. ¿Cómo pues les oímos nosotros hablar? Cada uno en nuestra lengua en la que hemos nacido, partos, medos, elamitas, y los que habitamos en Mesopotamia, en Judea, en Capadocia, en el Ponto y en Asia, en Frigia y Panfilia, en Egipto y en las regiones de África más allá de Sirene, y romanos aquí residentes. Tanto judíos como prosélitos, cretenses y árabes, les oímos hablar en nuestras lenguas las maravillas de Dios. Stanze autem Petrus comun decem, lewawit vocem suam, et locutus est eis, viri iudai, et qui habitatis Jerusalem universi, hoc vobis notum sit, et arbus percipite verba nea. Non enem sicut vos aestimatis, hi ebrei sunt, cum sit hora diei tertia, sed hoc est quod dictum est per propetam Johel. Muhumisi ya nyuma, huko ni kwe mani vuga. Nzo kuira giza mutima wanje kumundu wese. Aba hungu na bakoga wanyo, bado kuigisha kaba hanuzi. Inisori yanyo, ibone kegwe. Aba kura mbere wanyo, nabu varoti ndoto. Ego chani, uri yo misi, nzo kuira giza mutama wanje, kubasuku wanje, no kuncha wareke zi. E farò prodigi su nel cielo, e segni giù sulla terra, sangue e fuoco e vapore di fumo. Il sole sarà mutato in tenebre e la luna in sangue, prima che venga il grande e glorioso giorno, che è il giorno del Signore. Ed è farà che chiunque avrà invocato il nome del Signore sarà salvato. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, how great thou art. You wrap yourself with light as with a cloak. You lay the beams of your shoulders as waters of sun. You make the clouds of the You cover them with the deep as with a mantle. The waters stood higher than the mountains. The waters than mountains. At your rebuke, the waters fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. They went up into the hills and down you into the, the valleys. They should not you sent the streams into the valleys. The beasts drink their fill. The asses quench their thirst. You, you water the mountains from your dwelling on high. The, the earth is fully satisfied. You water the mountains. 
You have appointed the moon to mark the seasons, and the sun knows the time of its setting. You make darkness that it might be night, in which all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar after their prey. And seek their food from God. The sun rises. And they slip away. And lay themselves down in their dens. Men and women go forth to their work and to their labor until evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it them, they gather it. You open their hands and they are filled with good things. You hide your face and they are terrified. You take away their breath and they die and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit, and you they are created. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. is my living epistle. My experience of the divine, my entry into spiritual life, I guess, has always been stories, all kinds of stories. The Bible, of course, Noah's Ark, the Moses Saga, the woman at the well, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, um, but also books. I grew up steeped in the stories of the Odyssey of Anthony Burgess, Slaughterhouse-Five, and of course, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But I'm also struck by the importance of the stories of my own life, my personal parables. One time I was teaching Sunday school, we were learning about one of the parables, and one of the kids said, why did Jesus teach in parables? Why couldn't he just tell people his message? And why indeed? Um, Jesus said, when you see me, you have seen the Father. So I think Jesus taught in parables because that's the way God speaks to us and teaches us and guides us. I think God shows up in the things that happen to us. So it's pretty important 
may be crucial to pay attention to the parables in our own life stories. This is the way God tells us, each one of us, about our place in God's kingdom. So, I'm going to tell you a story. Many years ago, a very close friend of mine, son, eight-year-old son, was dying from a brain tumor. And she called me one day and asked me to help her pick out a grave site. And of course I said yes. What she didn't know, because she was Jewish and very preoccupied, was that it was Christmas Eve. I helped her pick out the site and every Christmas Eve after that, it became my tradition to go to the cemetery and pray at Adam's gravestone. Several Christmases in a row, my family went to North Carolina to spend Christmas with my parents. So on the first Christmas we were in town, on Christmas Eve, it was a busy day and I had a late start getting out to the cemetery and it was closed. The gate was over the entrance, so I parked on the street and snuck in. It was dusk and I was a little disoriented because many new gravestones were there. And suddenly, a little light golf cart pulled up and it had rakes and hoes in the back. And the gardener came over and said, can I help you? And I told him I was looking for a grave. And he said, who are you looking for? And I gave him Adam's name. He led me over to the gravestone. And then he said, you know, every day his father comes and cries at the grave. And I just wish there was a way for him to know that Adam's just fine. He's safe. He's happy. And then he got in his golf cart and drove away. I walked back to the car in the growing darkness of this frigid Christmas Eve. And I was suddenly immobilized by the realization of what had just happened. The gardener at the graveside with his message of comfort and love. And I was filled with wonder and fear at this glimpse, this little glimpse of the fearsome power of God let loose in the world. I've, I've also found meaningful stories in the trajectory of our children's lives, in the wisdom gleaned from imaginative children in my years of teaching Sunday school, in the breathtaking perfection of a hornet's nest. These wonderful messages within the happenings in our lives. And that's my story. Thanks for listening. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So today is the Feast of Pentecost and the day that Christians celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. We've got two uh, great scripture texts from today. Uh, first, the famous Acts story of that actual moment of the coming of the Spirit and what happened immediately thereafter that we just heard read in, in multiple languages. And then there's that gospel story from John where Jesus talks about this spirit. Um, I'm going to start with that. So the word that Jesus used to describe this coming spirit in the Greek is paraclete. Uh, it's a fairly well-known term for some reason within many Christian circles. Um, and this word paraclete is translated in lots of different ways. Comforter, helper, in today's gospel, advocate. Um, but I found myself thinking this week about a, um, a, a less common translation of this term, uh, and that's mediator. Now, I'm being a little fast and loose here, uh, uh, but I'm thinking about the Holy Spirit as one who mediates in the world, as one who enters into the middle of places of brokenness and brings healing and reconciliation so even if that word mediator is maybe not the best translation, honestly, advocate's probably a more fair, uh, more accurate translation of the original word. Um, I think it's a theologically appropriate word to use um, because that is our understanding of some of what God does, God's spirit does, gets in there and mediates, uh, indwells in our world. And so if God's spirit is mediator and we are a people of God's spirit, um, then we too have some sort of mediating role to play in the world. Some role like the spirit to get in there, to roll up our sleeves and to make peace. The reason if you haven't <laughs> guessed already that this mediator word is what uh, I found myself thinking about is because of Palestine, Israel, the return of violence there. Their seemingly intractable and eternal conflict. What responsibility, if any, do we as American Christians have? What does it mean to be a people of the Spirit, the Spirit who is a mediator? A few thoughts I want to share about what this um, mediating responsibility um, might look like for us. First, I think a mediator is one who has a willingness to share and even concede. I read a about a, a Jordanian Muslim scholar named El Hassan bin Talal. He wrote this week about Jerusalem. El Hassan is a royal prince of Jordan, and as such, in their tradition, he's understood to be a direct descendant of Muhammad, and so is understood further to be a custodian of the Muslim and Christian holy sites in Jerusalem. In his tradition, he owns that to some extent. And yet, this is what El Hassan wrote. He wrote, Jerusalem is a shared gift, not the sole property of one government or one people. 
Elhassan, as much as anyone else, if not more so, would be entitled to stake a claim to exclusive ownership in the Holy Land. Yet he seeks an ethos of sharing. I think we Christians often fall too deeply into the trap of a sense of ownership. But mediation requires sacrifice and sharing. Two, I think a mediator is an advocate for those with less. Those on the outside looking in. An advocate for those that are voiceless and powerless. For those that are victimized and oppressed. You might have seen what our parishioner Alan Perez this past week wrote about Palestine, as well as the violent suppression of protesters in Colombia. Alan wrote this, let us denounce a carnage as we feel so called by the Holy Spirit. Today, Palestine and Colombia are bleeding. Let us pray for a cessation of violence, but let us not forget, not for an instant, who is the occupier Israel and who is the occupied Palestine. Let us not forget that U.S. taxpayer money fuels this violence. And let us remember that God's justice is not neutral and never sleeps. Silence in this matter is a sin. We must be a moral voice, the voice of the prophets. I don't think being a mediator following in the way of the Spirit does not mean we refrain from speaking up in particular for those who have no voice. For advocating for those who are marginalized. I think we're called to be mediators when we follow the Spirit, when we put the oppressed first. But three, I also think the mediator cannot fall into the trap of demonizing the oppressor or separating fully from the oppressor. Israel, Israel is an occupier who oppresses the Palestinians. And while we do not and cannot justify the occupation, we also need to listen and have, and in this case, of course, have sympathy for these people who are, were on the receiving end of the genocide that is Holocaust and who still experience massive anti-Semitism, both overtly and uh, institutionally and system systemically in our world. We mediators are called to advocate for the oppressed and also to give our ear to those who are oppressors. Now I say this honestly with some reticence. It's easy to talk about Palestine and Israel to some extent because I'm not Jewish, I'm not Palestinian, and the conflict is over the sea. But it's harder when I imagine this dynamic of, of both advocating for the oppressor and listening to, the, or advocating for the oppressed and listening to the oppressor, rather, um, when you bring it home. When I'm no longer a third party uh, to the conversation. You know, it's easy to, to mimic Jesus, you know, who says, love your enemy. Um, but personally, as a straight white male, I don't have that many enemies. And so I say I think we should listen to our oppressors with some reticence. I certainly don't fully understand oppression or the experience of many disempowered groups in our country, and so I'm sure I'm missing a lot here. I know that there are surely times, particularly for those that are oppressed, when it is absolutely not the time to listen to the voice of the oppressor. It will only lead to further hurt and oppression, nothing that leads towards healing and reconciliation. There are absolutely times when people need to stay away from those that have in the past and might still victimize. But still, I do believe there are also times when we all need to lean into hard relationships. Henry Nouwen said, in the face of the oppressed, I recognize my own face and in the hands of the oppressor, I recognize my own hands. We need to advocate for the victims of the world and listen to its victimizers, not only because it's the right thing to do to bring justice and 
not just for the healing of the world, but it might be also important for our own souls and for facing our own complicity in oppression. There are oppressors in the world and inner oppressors in our hearts, and we need to grapple with them both. And sometimes the inner work only happens when we come uh, starkly in, uh, in face of the oppression that's outside in the world. One more thought before I move on. Um, if you're going to try to be in relationship with both sides, those with the power and those who are persecuted, how can we do so in a way that won't require us either to fall into the false equivalencies that we know about, you know, claiming that it's, 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 uh, it's just two sides of a, of a coin when, when one has the power and one does not, when one is the oppressor and one is the oppressed? Or how do we uh, avoid the trap of just sort of letting the, the oppressor, the one with the, ener uh, the power, sort of suck up all the energy? You know, we, we know that when you put together someone with power and someone who doesn't, usually the one with power sort of tends to do all the talking, right? And so I found myself thinking this week a little bit about um, how Jesus uh, engaged in his, uh, I don't know, workforce recruitment strategy, his calling of disciples. You know, he started uh, with the call of Peter and then James and John these simple Fisher folks, it seems, not from a, a particularly high social strata. And they were not only the first, but they remained his inner circle. It was only later that he began to sort of add to the team um, with, with folks uh, from other contexts. Um, and one in particular that uh, I found myself thinking about is this uh, employee of the Roman Empire. So, you know, thought by many to be a collaborator and a traitor. Um, he was a tax collector. Um, and tax collectors were known uh, not only for uh, working for the empire, but also for being corrupt. Um, and, and of course, this guy's name was Matthew. Matthew did get invited to the table, but he wasn't the first. And he wasn't on the, in the inner circle, we don't believe. It was only after Peter and the others were there and established that, Pete, that Matthew was, was, was invited in. I wonder if the Peters of the world always need to come before the Matthews, because the Matthews so often take up all the space when they're there. And so it makes me wonder, you know, we talk a lot about welcoming people to the table, bringing new seats to the table. I'm wondering if that's good enough. I'm wondering if we need to entirely scrap the tables and get new ones and start over because those that, that are at the seats uh, already um, don't really know how to give space to those that are coming in. Last thought, and I'm, um, I'm totally switching gears here, um, but I think it's worth it the time. So today's Acts story, the one that we heard in different languages, um, many of you know this story inside and out. Um, the disciples are hiding out in Jerusalem after the death of Jesus. They're uh, sheltering in place, if you will. Um, and then the time comes when it's time for them to leave, to go forth. And the Spirit, as it said, comes upon them like fire like violent winds, and they start speaking, proclaiming the truth that they know, and the words that they speak somehow are understood no matter the language that the listener ha knows. There is this new energy, this new uh, falling of barriers and divisions across language, across age, across ethnicity. It is so vibrant and wild that this chaos looks to onlookers like drunkenness. I think Pentecost is coming again as we emerge from pandemic. It's not gonna make all the sense in the world. It too might look a little like drunkenness, but I think there will be new relationship 
new connection, a new capacity to hear and be heard, to be mediators, and also an energy that we might have thought at times in the last 15 months that we would never be able to access again. That energy God promises to give to us again and again and again. Will there be answers and clarity? I don't think so. But energy and connection and chaotic delight? Absolutely. Dear people of God, on this day of Pentecost, the Church calls us to celebrate the gifts of the Spirit and as a sign of our baptism in the Spirit, invites us to renew our baptismal vows and reaffirm once again the promises which bind us to Christ and to each other. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I will, with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will with God's help. Will you cherish the wondrous works of God and protect the beauty and integrity of all creation? I will with God's help. The prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Michael, our presiding bishop, and Alan and Gail, our bishops, for the community of St. James's, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, particularly in Palestine, Israel, and Colombia, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any kind of need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask for your prayers and thanksgivings aloud or in silence as you wish at this time.
praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit be our goal and our strength, now and always. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hello, and welcome to St. James's. My name is Mary Caulfield. I'm one of the parishioners here. We're all so happy to see that you've joined us today. In our announcements, we hope you'll celebrate St. James's Day with us, Sunday morning, July 25th. The plan is to have an in-person outdoor service that Sunday morning in our new church garden. The arrangements to be able to do it safely and in accordance with all public health directives is still in the works, but we wanted to let you know that that's what we're hoping for. There will also be an online worship offering that morning for those that, for any reason, decide against attending an in-person gathering. On June 13th, there will be a fun, socially distanced, water-themed outdoor event for youth, children, and families at Sarah Forrester's house. A sign-up will be coming out soon in Sunday News and in the Children and Youth Mailing. Our upcoming preaching schedule is Sunday, May 30th, which is Trinity Sunday. Our assistant treasurer, John Irvine, will be the preacher. Sunday, June the 6th, Reverend Matt will be preaching. And Sunday, June 13th, Reverend Julia is preaching. Thank you so much for listening to these announcements, and have a wonderful week. May God's holy, healing, enabling spirit be with you, and be your guide as your road changes and turns. And the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Let us go forth, known, loved, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs>